collaborative and open source platform for uh, geological modeling. This presentation is done by Laurent Ayer from the, the Monash University in Australia. So hello, hello, Laurent. Thank you. Thank you to be with us and, and sorry for the time difference. You are okay. currently in, in Australia. Uh, just a few words to, to introduce you. Um, Laurent has a, has a double background in field and computational geology, especially in, uh, in structural geology and, and geophysics uh, on several, uh, with fields on several continents. Uh, and he was uh, on the, the computational uh, geology side. He was close to the development of the of the GoCAD modeling package in France a few uh, a few years ago. And nowadays, uh, Laurent leads the Loop initiative that is the scope of uh, his presentation today. So please, Laurent, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Philippe, and uh, thank you for, for having me. Thank you for the European Geological Survey for inviting me to give that presentation. Um, I'm going to try to show my skills in computing by sharing my screen. Yep, and presentation is on. Um, so you should see my presentation, hopefully in, in the proper mode. Oops, there's a pointer. All right, so I'm going to present uh, the Loop platform, which is a project that started about um, four to five years ago. Uh, it's been developed, I'll talk about the sponsors afterwards, but uh, sorry, the, the aim of it is to develop uh, an open source integrative religious really modeling platform that would take into account all of the uh, field data, including uh, three hole intersections and uh, interpretation from geophysical data sets, seismic or magnetic and gravity. Uh, and the reason for this platform is that we want to enable um, building, automatic building of 3D model in hard rock geology terrain, so in, in complexly deformed and metamorphic terrains. Um, the project is, uh, is not only me, there are lots of people behind the, behind the development that I'm going to demonstrate today. Uh, these are probably the main uh, actors at the moment. And our uh, sponsors team, is including a lot of international geological surveys, so the British Geological Survey, the USGS, the Canadians, and the Australians, obviously. And we also have uh, participation from all our uh, federal, state, and territory surveys in, in Australia, and uh, including CSR as well. And uh, we work with uh, UWA in Australia, and also we collaborate a lot with uh, the Ring uh, Group in uh, University de Lorraine in Nancy, where the GOCAD consortium started. Uh, quite a little, many years ago, and also uh, collaborate with Florian, uh, Florian Wellman Group at, uh, at uh, Aachen University. Um, the beauty of this uh, group of people or group of organization is that not only providing um, cash for us to be able to employ people to do the research and, and the development, but they also participate in the research. Uh, there is a one aspect I'm not going to talk about uh, of loop, which is the, uh, the data mining, the, uh, the, the you know gray literature mining, uh, and geological ontology, uh, which is something that I am definitely not an expert in, and I shouldn't talk about it. But uh, this work is done essentially by the, the International Geological Survey. So again, including the, the Canadians, uh, with Brian Broderick and Steve Richards, who developed a geological ontology that we still have to use. Uh, the British Geological Survey, the group of Rachel Levin, uh, she's been very busy developing um, data mining or text mining methods to try to extract more information out of the literature. And, uh, and that's also this work is done in collaboration with uh, Geoscience Australia. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about this part, which is actually the integrative part where we're trying to get as much data set or as much, as much data and knowledge into the modeling uh, process. But I'm going to talk about uh, once you you got a map, for example, served by a geological survey. How can you get from that map to a 3D model? Um, so as I said before, the rationale is really to provide a platform for uh, better subsurface resources management. We want to be able to uh, use as many data sets as we can, uh, build 3D models with uncertainty, and to do this, we have to have an automated platform. So we need to be able to analyze the map automatically generate data sets that we call them, um, um, doesn't matter what we call them, <laughs> sorry, 
um, generate data sets that are actually ingestible or digestible by uh, loops factual, which is our um, modeling modeling engine. Um, uh, of course, we want to propagate also uncertainty to be able to uh, mitigate risk and uh, understand what we know and understand what we don't know. Uh, and there is also an aspect of integrating uh, geophysical methods, not only at the end of the modeling process, uh, as we do today uh, routinely to falsify some of the models, but we actually want to use geophysics to infer some of those parameters that we need to build the 3D models. So as I said, the, unfortunately, the current technology is not um, well adapted to modeling polydeformed terrains uh, in a reproducible sense. Of course, you can draw cross section by hand. You can, you know, link those cross sections in an explicit sense or even in an implicit sense using platforms like uh, GoCAD, GoCAD QR, uh, GeoModeler, or, or even GemPy. Uh, but it, it, it still remains very uh, non-reproducible because it's a building on you drawing the cross sections that you want the 3D model to look like. Um, there is a need for uncertainty characterization, obviously. So this is something uh, that's uh, in demand more and more because people want to understand how uh, the predictions of the, the subsurface geology uh, are reliable this is. And, and there is a need for better geophysical integration. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm, I can demonstrate where we're going with this. We haven't done enough yet, but this is uh, one of our focus for the, for the future of the project. To do this, we need to have an automated system. Um, so let's go back to, to what a 3D geological model is, and I, I don't want to tell you uh, what you already know, but basically we, we start from observations, so field observations, or uh, geophysical interpretations, and and that's uh, another world of uh, uncertainty coming in when you start doing interpretation as well. Uh, there is, so yeah, so geophysical interpretation, for example, the seismic through here, and then also concepts. And the concepts, we've actually tried to implement them in the modeling engine. So we're trying to um, have a system that will model structures uh, the same way as a structural geologist would look at them in the field and imagine them in the head. So you combine those three characteristic first algorithm and and you have a pretty pretty model that usually sits in the in the head of the geologist that just maps uh, the area and it's actually quite hard to uh, to build into a proper geological model because the systems are uh, at the moment I think looks more like this so you have your observations you have your interpretations you have your concepts you have some algorithms and then we actually don't know uh, exactly what we're doing with the 3D modeling packages. I, I know I don't want to offend anyone here, but uh, I know that some people are producing very beautiful and very good 3D models, but um, it, it is a little bit of a, of a honest nest and, and you don't really know um, the quality of your output, if you, if you see what I mean. So what we've done is we've developed uh, two libraries. We've developed other libraries that are uh, doing some other things, but the main libraries are map to loop which is a library over here. And then the, and map to loop is doing an automated analysis of theoretical maps. And that's feeding uh, information and, and data to loop structure, which is our um, modeling engine. So basically the workflow is uh, geological surveys are going to serve data, hopefully. <laughs> uh, most of them do. Um, but he may have Again? Okay, I keep going. <laughs> Sorry. So geological surveys can serve uh, data, obviously. They serve maps. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to grab that data. So grab the, the, poly the polygons from the lithological uh, domain. We want to grab the, uh, the structural data, structural measurements on those maps. And we basically represent uh, the information on the map as a graph. And it's a graph which is time aware. So we actually have the stratigraphy is time away, obviously, and we also have uh, structural features that are, uh, you know, related to your D1, D2, D3 events. And we want to build this into um, into a, a graph system that can then be fed into loop structural. And loop structural is also a time away library. And we're building the events in uh, in reverse. So we start from the youngest events and then go backwards and build the 3D models this way. I'm going to demonstrate this. So if we look at map to loop so here is a map on the on the left hand side it's a synthetic map uh, is basically made of 
a conformable series of rocks that has been folded. There is an unconformity on the northwest corner over here, and there is a fold going through uh, through the fold, uh, through the folded series. And what we want to do is we want to extract information automatically to feed into the, the modeling engine. So we can, for example, grab the, the basal contact from the map. So we grab a few points, or we will grab the lines, which represent the base of our formations. Uh, we also uh, capture the, uh, the the location of the unconformity and capture the location of the fault. We obviously also capture the structural measurements of bedding. And we also can build from that, we can build a stratigraphic column, which can be at two level, two, two different levels of uh, granulometry. So this could be at the formation level and this could be at the stratigraphic level or the group level. Um, and then that allows you to build different type of models at different, uh, I guess, resolution. We can also uh, use um, apparent offset measurements for the faults. That gives us uh, an idea of what the, the fault may have been doing. Uh, we may want to assume that the fault is uh, a strike slip system, or uh, unfortunately, with faults, very often the data served are not sufficient. So we never know. We, we very often don't have any structural information about the fault. So we don't know the shape of the fault, and we don't know the offset. Uh, amplitude or, or direction. So this is something where um, we're looking at using geophysics and Bayesian inference to uh, to to infer the parameters related to the fault. And I'm going to show you this towards the end of the talk. Um, and this is this is all done automatically. So this is an example from the Pilbara in, in uh, northwest Australia, and this is in the uh, Amersley Basin. This is an area in Australia which has uh, many many. Uh, iron ore deposits, so it's been studied uh, quite well and it's been mapped quite well. On this map, you have uh, stratigraphy, you have intrusions. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you have intrusions and you have stratigraphy, uh, folder stratigraphy with the Turner syncline over here. I, I say those names because they're going to come back. The rock layer dome and the Brockman syncline through here. You have uh, measurements of the um, of the strike and deep of, uh, of bedding, and you also have faults. And the faults, again, don't have any information related to their geometry, nor to their offset. We also have uh, a DTM, which can, we can put that data in context and also infer some geometrical parameters for the, for the stratigraphy. And we can build uh, the stratigraphic pile by looking at the relationship between the different formations. So the arrows here is telling you uh, which formation is on top of, of the other formation. So this is again automatically done. And at the same time, we can capture uh, information for, for loop structural. So we can capture the base of those contacts. We can capture the, the trace of the faults. We can also uh, guesstimate the, the, the fault offset, at least on a, on a map view. In this case here, we are assuming that the faults are vertical with a vertical offset, which obviously is wrong, but this is um, an assumption we can make. Uh, we can also calculate the fault minimum offset. And um, and this is something we want to go to. So very often, the, the fault uh, actual surfaces are not traced, or they're not attributed in terms of time or deformation event. And this is something we're working on to try to analyze. Uh, so foliation information, if there is on the map, very often there is no foliation information, but to try to look at uh, the structural measurements on the maps and uh, do some local um, structural geology statistics to, to, to infer the fault plunge, so stair on S basically, to infer the fault plunge and the actual surface of the faults and, and use this to uh, to characterize the geometry of our folding event. Obviously, we can also calculate uh, a distribution of thicknesses per formations, uh, and, and we also look at the uh, at the relationship between the faults and the different uh, layers. So we look at the, the fault fault relationship, but also the fault formation relationships, uh, very similar to what um, we built in GeoModeler, for example, manually as a, as a history for, the, for the, the part of the world we want to model. So this is done automatically once again. <coughs> Sorry. And once you've done this, you can then send this information and the, uh, and the, and the information about the deformation events to look structural, and you get a, a model that looks like this in about 15 minutes on uh, now that a laptop that was two years ago. So it doesn't require a lot of uh, compute power. Of course, if your model uh, becomes bigger, it will require 
uh, more compute power, but uh, this is working quite nicely on a, on a normal laptop. All of the calculations, all the interpolations are done on a tetrahedric mesh. Uh, that doesn't change, it's just a, a numerical support. If we compare um, the output of the model, so this is, is the colors correspond to the top surface of the output of the model, the lines correspond to the map. Um, um, it, it looks like the, the, the modeling algorithm is working um, satisfactorily, but you can see that there are errors. I'm going to point out this one, but you will find, I'm sure you will find many more errors in the model. Uh, and these errors here are related to the lack of knowledge in the, in the fault geometry and the fault offset. So that's something we're working on and looking also at using the, the map pattern plus the geophysical response of this area to locally do uh, an inversion of the parameters of the fault to try to fit both the geophysics and the map pattern in a Bayesian sense. And I'm going to show you this towards the end. Um, <clears throat> so we've done, this is actually the work of Mark Vessel from UWA. We've done demonstrations of uh, the method for all the states in, in Australia, all the state and territory in Australia. Uh, this is an example from South Australia in the Flinders Ranges. This is a series of uh, folded stratigraphy through here. I don't know if you can see the, the stratigraphy in the background. The red dots are structural measurements of bedding and bedding only. And um, so there is a lot of data here. There is a lot of the polygons for the for the lithologies are also uh, included. And from the time uh, you drew a rectangle on this map and press a button, it takes about um, 11 minutes to build this model over here. Uh, which I don't think has many faults because there was no faults on the uh, on the map. So this is completely automated from data served by the uh, South Australian Geological Survey to a 3D model in, in, in 11 minutes. <coughs> um, so how do we do this in terms of uh, building the um, building the geometries or building the, the, stru the structural geology? Um, so what differentiates loop from any other packages is that instead of, so any other packages when they build implicit models, build a scalar field for uh, lithology basically, or a scalar field for stratigraphy. We build three scalar fields for every event. So a folding event is an event, a fault is an event, stratigraphy, conformable stratigraphy is an event. And we build three, um, three scalar fields which are related to uh, the structural element of that object. So for example, for folds, we're going to build a scalar field which is perpendicular to the actual surface of the fold. So the, this, this scalar field will, will increase, for example, in that direction. We're going to have a scalar field going along the fold axis, and then we have uh, a first scalar field which is basically parallel to the extension direction of the fold. So we use uh, the finest strain ellipsoid related to folding. We do the same thing for fault. So there is a scalar field perpendicular to the fault. There is a scalar field along the offset direction. And then there is a third scalar field in the fault plane and uh, perpendicular to the offset direction that indicates the, the length of the fault, if you want. And this allows us to, um, to characterize, well, this allows us to do the modeling. For intrusion, we do the same thing. So for the intrusions, we have a scalar field which is uh, growing with uh, the uh, the flow directions of the intrusion, a scalar field which is um, growing in the direction of growth of the of the intrusion, so the thickness of the intrusions, and then we have a third, third scalar field that um, uh, characterizes the lateral extent of the intrusion. And I'm going to show you an example of this, uh, starting with the faults. So the faults are defined similarly to what uh, Gabby Gautroy did in uh, 2018. Uh, they're finite faults, they're ellipsoids, so they're basically um, slip zones, but they're actually ellipsoids. So we define a, a damage zone, and the damage is uh, represented by those curves and growing, so decreasing away from the center of the ellipsoid. And so all we need is we need the center of the ellipsoid, the orientation of the ellipsoid, and, uh, and then the way the, the, uh, the way the damage is decreasing from that center. Uh, and that means we also need to know the, uh, the offset and offset direction. Um, the way it works is, for example, here, if you have a, a normal fold going through here and you have two observations of a given stratigraphy, uh, what we do is we uh, restore, if you want, the fault displacement. So we move, this, we move this point back to where it was before faulting. 
we then interpolate the stratigraphy and then apply the faulting again. So again, and this is calculated on a on a triangulated mesh here, but that's a tetrahedric mesh in, in 3D. Again, this requires the knowledge of the fault offset, the fault direction, the, the offset direction. Um, so this is an example here with a black fault. Uh, those dots represent the uh, outer shell, if you want, of, a, of an intrusion or an object. And you can see it's been faulted. So the first thing we do is we restore the location of those points, then interpolate the ellipsoid or the interpolate, sorry, the, the convex hull of that uh, type of points, and then apply the, uh, the fault offset again to create our geometries. And this is applied uh, through the entire model but depending on the size of the uh, damage zone. Of course, away from the damage zone, there is no movement, there is no restoration <coughs> and no modifications of the, of the location of the points. Okay. Um, so this is how it looks in, in, uh, in another example. Uh, this is a curve fault. Uh, this uh, arrow shows the, uh, the displacement direction. Of course, on one side of the fault, it's going to go in the other direction. Uh, this is Showing the displacement field. I'm sorry, I've got a bit of a, <coughs> a bit of a cough. Yep, this is showing the displacement field. So your fault is through here, and there is displacement, positive displacement, and negative displacements along the offset direction. This is a result in a, in a cube, if you want, in a, in a 3D cube, and that's uh, a boundary representation of that same uh, same model. So we end up with geometries which are. Uh, more reliable and, and the difference, for example, from the step function is actually the, the offset is following the kinematics of the fault and following the shape of the fault. For the intrusion, so similarly, we, we need to know the anisotropy, so we, we only build intrusions at the moment that are uh, controlled by a given anisotropy in the, in the host rock. So we build, uh, we first need to build the, uh, this host rock model, um, and so and the, the first direction in orange here represents the uh, the anisotropy of that uh, ostrock and is going to be uh, parallel to the flow direction. The uh, pink uh, surfaces here shows that there are other surfaces of a scalar field which is parallel to the flow direction, and the green as a surface represents the scalar field uh, that characterizes the lateral extent of the intrusion. And this is the work of, uh, of Fernando Alvarado Neves, who just completed our um, PhD at, uh, at Monash. In more detail, when we build a structural frame with those uh, three different scalar fields, we then fit a conceptual model, and the conceptual model can be um, a parallel pipette, can be an ellipsoid, or can be just an ellipse like this with, uh, with some thickness, or can also be a wedge. And we then interpolate those shapes within the structural frame and then fit the boundary of the intrusion to the data, to the observation from, uh, from field observations. So this is what's being shown here. This was the uh, original conceptual model and this is now the, the intrusion fitted to the lateral extent of the intrusion. These are cross section for this intrusion. So we're trying to fit uh, the base, the roof and, uh, and the base of the, of the intrusion to that ellipsoid. And these are views of the intrusions in um, in 3D here from the top, and then uh, and then some cross section for for the intrusions. So we actually are able to reproduce intrusions that are um, <clears throat> I'm going to say realistic and fitted to the data. So this is another example here. It's a little bit synthetic as well. So this is our uh, Ostrock model. We have uh, horizontal stratigraphy offset by a reverse fault, <laughs> and you can see the point down here and through here, but also there are some points in green surface. I'm really sorry, you can't really see them. But those points are representing the base of the intrusion. So that means that from our observation, the interpretation is that the, um, the, the seal that was being intruded here in the stratigraphy arrived at the fault and then used the fault as a main anisotropy and split into two different stratigraphic levels and basically went from one segment of that seal to three segments. <clears throat> and this is what uh, is reproduced here. The color corresponds to the difference in, in elevation. So you can see that we go from one seal, so that was this part of the, of the world here, uh, propagation in, in that direction, 
and is also still allowed. So one of them was stepped up using the fault. And on uh, intersection, you have now face fields. So this so face segment, sorry, this is a cross section through here. And across this cross section here would be more for there. So there is a, uh, an eventual uh, separation of the, of the face segment. <laughs> sorry. Um, this was tested in uh, in Tasmania in in the Hobart area where there are uh, many many seal complexes, um, and uh, I found that I actually used uh, modeling to test the molecular policies, which is uh, something I really like to do because I don't I just don't want to build three D models for the sake of them. I want to build three D models to do something with them. And in this case, we tested four different hypotheses, which I'm not going to go through. Unfortunately, I don't have time. But uh, she is basically looking at the influence of the anisotropy in the half park and the anisotropy provided by the fault, whether they are pre-intrusions or C-intrusions or post-intrusions, and looking at those faults and and the variation in anisotropy to try to reproduce the map pattern. We don't want, so we're not using the map, we're not using the contact on the map because maps are already um, models and interpreted geology. We actually were lucky to be able to use observations. So in blue here, you have observations of the lateral contact to the seals. In uh, purple, you have the roof contacts. And in, in green, in green, for example, down here and along here, you have uh, observations of the floor contacts. So we have we have a good constraints on the thickness of those seals. They actually are popping quite well. Mount Wellington, which is above uh, Hobart is, is about a thousand meters and Hobart is at sea level and the entire hill must be the, is a big seal, a big columnar joints coming up. So we have a very good outcropping, very good observations. But the models I'm going to show you, I really want you to, to, um, to get that point. The models I'm going to show you are just built using those points. So lateral contacts, some roof contacts, some base contacts, using the faults and using different faults for the different model to test uh, the geological history, and also we have some uh, anisotropy of magnetic flexibility data to give us an idea of the flow direction. And the flow direction is basically roughly from uh, southeast to northwest. So, finally, that came up with four models uh, testing different analysis. Again, I'm not going to go through the different analysis, but uh, this model here is the best one, and it shows that the model can be built with three seals. This is also something that um, we didn't know how many seals do you need to know. Do you need to have to reproduce the, uh, the quantity or the volume of uh, dolerite there is in the Hobart area? It looks like we needed three seals, and uh, the pre, uh, some of the pre intrusion faults were uh, essential to actually try to reproduce some of those elements through the map. So the map here in, in light blue, unfortunately, is uh, no outcrop or no map, no zero map, it's the, it's the ocean. Uh, but also, uh, we predicted this map here. So the map pattern is, is similar. Again, we don't want to reproduce the map pattern because the map is not uh, based on observations everywhere, but we want to, to reproduce a map which makes uh, sense in terms of distributions of some of those uh, fields through here, through there, and for example, uh, this field going across here, which we were not able to reproduce in all of the models. So this is showing, so I'm not saying that one model is better than the others, by the way. We, we actually don't really know, but this is showing that we can use 3D models to test those color policies and not just um, spin it on in a computer and, and make them look pretty. <laughs> um, for falls, I don't want to go too much in details, but I need them to talk about the, the bias in front. So for falls, we remember we have a scalar field going horizontally through here, so perpendicular to the actual surface of the fold. And uh, we use what we, we call the, an S plot to try to uh, characterize the fault profile. So this is the value of the uh, actual scalar, um, actual surface scalar field down here. So going across through there, and we sample the fold at multiple locations and uh, calculate the rotation of the limb. So, so for example, in the at the hinge, the rotation is zero. At the in the limb here, the rotation will be about sixty degrees. And if you had isoclinal fold, it would go from 60 degrees to minus 60 degrees. So it's a sine angle. And we can plot that on this S plot. So we got the actual surface color field through here. And here is a rotation of the fold limb. And basically, the angle we, we're plotting is a complement angle to uh, verdance. 
So in the hinge, as I said, we are zero rotation, so the hinge would be here. The limbs are at the maximum angle, so the limbs are somewhere in there. And we then use a um, Fourier series to fit uh, to fit uh, to fit that curve. And that, that Fourier series characterizes the geometry of the fold throughout the entire uh, model. So the way it works, uh, as I said, it, it's uh, a time-aware system. So if we have, for example, two folding events, we're going to calculate the youngest projection first. So this is, I'm assuming the, the projection is, is uh, straight and, and planar uh, because that's the youngest event. Then within that, <coughs> sorry, within that framework, we combine this color field with the observations of S1. Uh, S1, so the next youngest foliations, we also consider the fold axis, obviously, so we always do bump lines as well. <clears throat> and we can then characterize using those S plots, we can characterize the shape of the F2 folds, refolding the S1 foliation. So we can then calculate the S1 scalar field in uh, the 3D model, combine this with the observations of bedding, which is the next uh, youngest foliation. And uh, doing the S plots, again, we characterize the geometry like this, and we're then able to calculate the geometry of the refolded fold. If we were to use um, the current packages, you would just get, and just use the, uh, the bedding information, you would just get a, a simple doing something like this with no refolds and no continuous folding for the, for the model. So I think this is one of the, the main improvements, especially if you're working in pretty different terrains. <laughs> but as I said, very often we don't have the parameters, so we don't necessarily have uh, structural information. We don't necessarily have for the for the foliations. Where and more, most importantly, we don't have the information for the faults. So we are moving towards a, a Bayesian system to try to do to infer those parameters. And here is an example of a folded stratigraphy for here. So the, the actual surface will be through there. <laughs> we have a fault here, and all we know about the fault is that it's a structive fault. And we're trying to recover, uh, so basically the Fourier series parameters, so the, the coefficients of the Fourier series, the wavelengths of the fold. <coughs> I am so sorry. It's okay, Laurent. Take take your time. Uh, I just take the opportunity to to just to say if you have any question, of course you will be able to raise your hand at the end of Laurent's presentation. We still have like uh, five to ten minutes before ending. Otherwise, you can, of course, uh, ask your question in the chat and we will come back to them. Please, Laura. Yeah, thanks, Philippe. So, so yeah, the parameters we, we're trying to infer from, from that data set with structural information from bedding here is uh, the fault offset and also the parameters of the Fourier series. So these are multiple realizations or so multiple samples from the, uh, from the sampler. Uh, the blue dots correspond to the data we can plot uh, across that fold. And so the basically the rotation angle of the of the limbs. And uh, so you can see that when you're closer, close to data, of course, the, uh, the uncertainty is, uh, is less. And for all this realization, you can then plot the, uh, the joint uh, posterior distributions. And so, for example, on the side here, we have uh, C1, C2, C1, and C0, which are the coefficients of the Fourier series, uh, and the fault wavelengths here. And on the x-axis, you have the fault displacement, uh, the fault wavelengths, and then again, the, uh, the parameters of the Fourier series. So somewhere in there, you may have a model that would fit your data best. But uh, at the end of the day, all those models are possible, um, with, a, with the likelihood being the fit of the S-plot. So, uh, we're going so that that means that we can go towards a system which will be able to uh, characterize uncertainty as you're modeling, uh, as you're building your models. And we're not going to end up with one model, but we're going to end up with lots of models which will be characterized by uh, a, a joint probability, a joint posterior distribution for the parameters, and also we, so we can estimate you know which one is the best fit uh, model for there, and we can look at statistics of the different parameters, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> um, of course, if we if we could use geophysics to try to infer the, the fault offset or even the fault direction, we could reduce uh, the uncertainty quite significantly. And this is uh, some work we, we started to do here. Um, and so this is a synthetic model again. So it's a slightly folded stratigraphy. There is a fault through here. And that's our reference model. 
from that reference model, uh, you can calculate the uh, dash line, which is a, a graffiti profile of that reference model. And then what we did is we basically started with horizontal stratigraphy with known densities. And what we don't know is the location of the fault, the deep of the fault, and, and that's it. And, but we also don't know that the stratigraphy is folded. So we're trying to recover uh, the folds, the folds and recover the location of the fault. So what you see down here is four different qualizations, so four samples for the Bayesian inference. You can see the fit of the gravity, the calculated gravity from each of these sections with the, uh, with the expected gravity, and you can see the variations in, in deep and maybe location of, of the fault. So we, we're getting, um, <clears throat> we're getting a, a convergence, if you want, towards uh, the location of the fault and, and its orientation. So this is something we need to, to develop and of course apply to real case studies um, because that's important. Uh, these are showing the posterior distributions for two of the samplers. Uh, so for the displacement, for the, the offset along the fault, for the location of the fault and the, the dip of the fault. And these are the traces of the uh, Bayesian inversion just to show you that uh, we're not stuck in a local minima. <clears throat> And so we use uh, MCMC uh, samplers, uh, and it's also quite fast, not as fast as the modeling, though, because this time we have to, we actually don't have to calculate the models, but we have to feed the, uh, the S-plots. All right, I'm going towards um, the end here, and this is looking into the future. What we want to do is, uh, because we're building three scalar fields, that means that every object in the, in every loop object, is characterized by a curvilinear conformable coordinate system, which means we can calculate distances between different observations in every volume of the rocks uh, in every direction. So we can do geostatistics very easily. Um, if, you, if you have used the stratigraphic grid in GoCAD, we can do the transformation, the UVW to XYZ coordinate system, and do the geostatistics in a Cartesian uh, regular grid. <clears throat> and so, so this is something we're working on because we, we then want to attract industry funding because we, we want to make the funding sustainable. Uh, at the moment, we're funded by IRC, which is the uh, equivalent to the INR in France or European Competitive Research Funding in Europe. And, um, and, and we, we, I find this is a bit of a, of a big lottery system. And, and uh, if you don't get funded, then your project dies. So we're working hard on, the, on making the project more uh, sustainable. And, uh, and the vision is really to, to create more realistic digital twin of the geology. I don't really want to use the digi digital twin word because I think it's a bit of a buzzword, but uh, what, what we want to do is really improve the way we're mining because we, we need metals for, um, for you know, our energy transitions, but we need to mine better. We need to have a better recovery rate out of mines and it goes through a better characterization of the ore in the third dimension in, in the mines. And, um, and we also need to propagate uncertainty in our resource estimations or property uh, estimations or, or whatever else. So if, we, if we're able to characterize a volume of rock and in terms of you know, the geotechnical characteristics, the metallurgical characteristics, we can extract the rocks better and we can process it better than, in the, than, the, than the workflow in, into the, the processing plant. So this is really what uh, motivates us. Um, and, uh, and we, so, so, and the, the consequences of this is we can actually optimize the amount of drilling required. We can optimize the crushing. Crushing is the most, cons is the most energy consuming process in, in a mine site and basically also optimize. So reduce the amount of water required for, uh, for producing more metals. That's maybe a dream. Hopefully not. Um, if you followed Loop, um, we haven't been very active on, on the GitHub uh, recently, but um, this is what we've done in the last maybe year or year and a half. We, 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 we wrote entirely Map to Loop. This is the work of Roy Thompson. Uh, and in, in order to make it uh, more generic, so it can be applied to any maps, uh, we're working also very hard. On, the, on increasing the capability of map to loop I want map to loop to be able to analyze locally data sets to extract um, fault parameters, so the fold axes, the fold actual surfaces, uh, the other printings. Uh, and we're also looking at using geophysics in map to loop to infer those parameters for, for the faults or some other objects that we uh, don't know anything about, but just um, a polygon on the map, for example. 
uh, loop structural. So we've implemented the intrusion frame, so the work of Fernanda Alvarado, uh, and this should become available uh, soon. And that comes to complement, obviously, the implementation of the full frame and the full frame. Uh, in terms of funding, I don't know if you're interested in this, but we're actually quite lucky to be uh, supported by uh, those uh, geological survey internationally, but also uh, nationally. Uh, we're also supported by Oscope, which is um, an organization that provides funding for infrastructure development. So code writing, for example, is a perfect infrastructure. Uh, Airscope is very interested in loop as a way to generate messes with uncertainty. So messes of the geology with uncertainty to do uh, to link with another package that has been developed by Oscope for many years now called Underworld. Uh, this package was doing uh, geodynamic modeling, but they've adapted the time step so that you can actually do water flow modeling in uh, in post media or in, in geological models. So we're looking at uh, developing mesh with uncertainty from loop models to feed into Underworld. Uh, we also have a postdoc now that's going to be embedded in the Northern Territory Geological Survey to uh, develop case studies. We need case studies. We need to show, we need to know what doesn't work. We need to know what's hard. Um, and Rabia is also going to be involved in, in knowledge transfer and, and looking at how uh, data served by surveys can be maybe more uh, standardized and uh, and easier to digest by, by the loop platform. Um, we're working very hard on usability because at the moment uh, the libraries are Python libraries. If you don't know Python, it's quite hard to use. Um, and I think that's what stopped a little bit the, the case study development and, and our community growth. Uh, and we're also developing a, a web app uh, so that would access AWS in the background um, to run map to loop and loop, loop factor in the background and just you would have the, the results on, uh, on, on the web so you don't need compute power. <clears throat> and um, and we're also developing a uh, QGIS plugin uh, for map to loop so you should be able to display your map in, in QGIS and uh, use a plugin to do the, uh, the analysis of the map and possibly correct the map if some of the output for map to loop are and uh, not satisfactory. Um, I think I'm going to not talk about this, but uh, this is in the video. If you want to have a look, this is what we want to do uh, in the future. Uh, of course, on top of the usability work we're doing. And also at the bottom here, I talk about sustainable funding. That's probably uh, not interesting to you, but we're going to start a loop foundation, which is going to be similar to the QGIS um, business model, I guess. Um, hopefully, it's going to be as big as a QGIS uh, community. At the moment, it's going to be quite small. But uh, industry, so we also have some industry support for the Minex ARC, and in those participants have requested to have a, a commercial um, outlay, if you want, for, uh, for, um, for Loop. So I'm going to finish with that slide, and because I really like to thank all our sponsors, because again, they're providing research and they're providing cash for us to be able to employ people to do more research and, and development. And lastly, the project is actually developed and under the auspices of One Geology. So, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent, for your, for your presentation. Uh, it's time now for questions and discussion. So once again, if any question, please raise your hand and uh, you will be, of course, able to ask directly Laurent. Uh, we also have a, um, a couple of questions in the chat or a question in the chat from Martin. Uh, regarding, in fact, there are two questions regarding uh, the use of loop in sedimentary basins with only brittle deformation. Is it possible? Is there any, uh, any related uh, example or project? And the second question is about the use of borehole data in loop. Yeah. Yeah, so so the loop can be used in basins, obviously, if you have faults uh, and if you have stratigraphy, there is no issues there. Um, so you would, yeah, yes. It's a simple interpolation for us. Uh, the faults are uh, finite, so you don't get into the issues of having data everywhere. Um, so yeah, so it's actually yeah we we've done a, a big project with Geoscience Australia uh, using AEM interpretations. Uh, so very thin geology, I call it very thin geology. So very large extent, very uh, limited vertical extent, uh, and it's just a question of interpolating each surface on top of each other. There were no fault in that model, so we we haven't uh, used the fault 
frame for that model, but you could actually see that we could use uh, the initial interpolation to detect faults. And the other question, borehole. Uh, so yeah. borehole can be integrated as points, so that you'll be able to use them if you extract the points. So if you just desurvey your borehole, for example, you interpret your um, your, your contacts and, and your structural information. So we can have data in, in different dimension, but we haven't worked on visualizing the borehole as in, in the model. Um, there is also work being done at UWA to look at um, correlating lithological successions to stratigraphy to try to because so geological surveys really very often want stratigraphic model. Uh, when you look at boreholes, you don't always have the stratigraphy. If you have it, fine, use it. If you don't have it, you have the lithologies. So we're trying to look at you know the, the code bar of the lithologies to try to to, to translate that into stratigraphy. Okay. Oh, yeah, and Tim Kersey, Tim Kersey said something about. Uh, yeah, we have uh, feedback from Tim as well. Uh, positive feedback regarding the, the use in sedimentary basins. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so, is there any any comments, questions uh, regarding uh, Laurent's presentation? Uh, I'm going to make a comment. So, so if you go to GitHub. Uh, github.com and loop 3d don't get overwhelmed or don't get grumpy we know it's hard to use um, try to do what you can if you if you can and make sure that if there are bugs or if there are things that don't work make sure you put a uh, a bug request or a bug uh, i can't remember what it's called now but a bug thing in github so we can actually grow and and fix things and yeah and and again maybe if you don't know how to code be patient. We're going to make a, a web app that's going to make the uh, the work easier. Mm. Uh, a question from Mattis uh, in the in the chat about uh, about real world examples uh, and uh, and to test all. Uh, but you, I think you partly you answered it, this question regarding some project how the um, how the platform or the software uh, deals with uh, with the real example with with of course real data and and so on. And yes, compared, yeah, compared to other common uh, implicit modeling uh, tools. Yeah, so so uh, so we haven't really tested um, properly yet on world case studies. This is what we're lacking. Um, that's why we want to have more users, but at the same time, it's hard to use. So um, uh, that's also the reason why we're employing a new postdoc that's going to be embedded in NTGS. His job is going to build a 3D model of a 25, uh, 1 to 25,000 uh, map sheet in a basin. So we're starting with easy things. Um, so yeah, I can't really comment. I think the, the best, the, I think so, so comment the, the question about the uh, other platforms. Uh, I think the advantage of having that free scalar fields allow you to, um, it, it, it's almost like doing uh, linear interpolation. So free linear interpolations instead of interpolating a big system. So in, uh, in terms of computational time, I think it's faster. Uh, the, the implementation of the faults using kinematics is definitely more uh, reliable and more realistic compared to what faults do. Uh, similarly for the intrusions. But we haven't tested it. On, yeah, I have to be honest, we haven't tested it properly yet, and that's we need to do that. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, I, I have a question for you, Laurent, regarding um, uncertainties. You, so you you mentioned that uh, a bit in your presentation, and, and and for sure the question is much more simpler than than the answer uh, regarding uncertainties. But is there there, there are some plans uh, in loop regarding both uh, the computation of the uncertainties and the the way to display them in the in loop, can you say maybe a bit more on that? Yeah, so this big uncertainty is very hard. Yeah. So I think uh, <laughs> so the other thing is, so we're really going towards a probabilistic way of, so we, we basically built a parameterization of geology, uh, time aware parameterization of geology. Most of the parameters are unknown. So we're going towards a probabilistic modeling uh, system, which will propagate uncertainty. So um, if you have uncertainty on your data, it's going to be a prior, it's going to be a distribution with, you know, statistics attached to it. 
um, an average standard deviation, blah. And, and we will sample out of those different parameters, including some parameters that we may have estimated previously from local inversions of the geophysics. And the algorithmic is basically that's your Bayesian inference. So um, I understand what you're saying. We're not really good at characterizing the um, artifacts or, or um, uncertainty generated by the way we build our geological objects. So that's a bit of a hard one. Mm -hmm. But uh, there is always, because we fit into the data, we can also, and it's not a perfect fit all the time, uh, there is also a way to go back to the data and, and check that how far away you are from the actual data and, and use that maybe as an algorithmic uncertainty. Yeah, but my vision is, I don't think, <clears throat> Yeah, the, 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 yeah the, one of the questions behind the, the uncertainties is the, how to, to be able to characterize uh, regions of the, of the model as maybe more reliable than others and uh, if possible to quantify that and so on, it's still the, still the same kind of, uh, of issues. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it's very hard to visualize in 3D because yeah. the mm -hmm. model is uncertain everywhere. So, uh, but Guillaume Pierrot at UWA is doing quite a lot of work on uh, optimizing drilling. And it's basically to try to find the best location of the next drill hole to maximize the reduction of uncertainty. So I, I don't think, maybe we don't want to visualize uncertainty, but we want to use a system like Guillaume mm -hmm. to look at um, that will tell you basically where the maximum intensity is and and what to do or what to acquire to reduce that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So I see no raised hand or no more question in the chat. So uh, we still have time. If you if you have a, if you have a question, feel free. It's uh, it's now. Otherwise, we we are going. I think to conclude. <laughs> Okay, so we are coming to the end of, uh, of this webinar. Thank you again, Laurent, for sharing the, the status of Loop with us. And, uh, and thank you to, to all of you for your participation and, and watching the, the presentation. So once again, it will be available, in a, I think, in a, in a few days uh, on, the, on the EGS website and, and usual uh, EGS medias for, for replay. Thank you all. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you for having me too and thank you for being here. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks.